Good morning, everybody. This morning, a priest, a minister, and a guru were discussing the best position for prayer. There was a telephone repairman working nearby. Kneeling is definitely the best way to pray, said the priest. No, said the minister. I get the best results from standing with my hands outstretched to heaven. You're both wrong, said the guru. The most effective prayer is lying down, face down on the floor. The repairman could not contain himself any longer. He said, hey, fellas, the best praying I ever did was hanging upside down from a telephone pole. Now, seven, several years ago, Mother Teresa appeared on a television show called The Hour of Power in America. And the host, Paul Robert Schuler, reminded her that the show was being broadcast to 23 different countries around the world including her own native Yugoslavia. He asked her if there was one message that she would like to convey to all her viewers. Her response was, yes, tell them to pray, and then tell them to teach their children to pray. Now in today's gospel reading, Jesus and the disciples were following Mother Teresa's message. He told them to pray, and so he taught them how to pray. The lesson he gave them became the pattern for the prayer that we all know today, namely the Lord's Prayer. And the outline that he gave was threefold. Firstly, the promise of prayer, the reality of prayer, and the practice of prayer. Now, Jesus intended the words of the Lord's Prayer to portray the spirit of our prayers instead of just specific words. For Jesus, prayer was not just a form but a force, a power. Prayer was influential and vital in his life. And the same can be said for us. Our prayer takes many different forms, but it is often difficult to find the time and the energy to focus, to actually engage in prayer. The disciples themselves wanted to learn to pray and to integrate prayer into their own lives, to understand and to deepen their relationship with God and to find the words to offer. Jesus taught the disciples to make their prayer God-centered. The glory of God's name and the advancement of God's kingdom were to be their primary, their primary concerns for prayer. We also want to need these same things. We are to come before the throne of grace boldly. We are to live every moment knowing that a loving Heavenly Father is on our side he understands the problems of our lives. People have given up hope and trust. Little in life seems worthwhile, and faith has petered out for a lot of people. Now this parable encourages us to keep stirring up God until he gives us his ear. Whenever we pray, God is on our side. He is ready to listen for the sake of bringing us the best possible blessing. And this reminds me of a, a story about a little girl who was kneeling beside her bed one night. She said, Dear God, if you're there and you hear my prayer, please could you touch me? Just then she felt a touch on her shoulder and she got so excited. She said, Oh, thank you, God, for touching me. But then she looked around and saw that her older sister was standing behind her and she got a little bit suspicious. Did you touch me? The sister answered, Yes, I did. Now, why did you do that? She asked. Because God told me to, was the reply. When we face life's problems, we can do one of two things. We can run or we can pray. And Jesus helps us and the disciples develop an attitude of dependence. He teaches them and us to come to God as our father, not as our employer. We are to make requests, not demand things. We are to realize our constant need for forgiveness and not to shout in pride, look how well I'm doing. We are to request deliverance and not to promise that I'll try harder next time. Jesus never met anyone that he couldn't forgive. People he met were no better or no worse than the people we come across every single day of our lives. Some are strong, some are weak, 
Some were fortunate. Some had experienced bad break after bad break. But he loved them all. He came into the world not to condemn people, but to save people. God is exactly the same. He hears the prayers of the whole world, regardless of age, wealth, color, or creed. No one is too insignificant to be beyond his concern. Prayer is a privilege for the robust who come into the presence of God and approach the throne of grace with confidence, knowing what they want of divine providence. Now, does that mean that everything we ask for in prayer will be granted straight away? No. Sometimes God says yes, but then again, sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says, not now. And even sometimes he will say, no, but I've got something even better in mind for you. So God is the one who can and will provide us with what we truly need to live the life that Jesus calls us to live. The activist attitude that Jesus taught is based on the idea that we can do something for God. The disciples attitude was based on awareness that God can do something in us. Doing God's will on earth means putting down of evil and the putting up of good. Prayer is not a five minute exercise in devotion time. It means that you have the, you have the desire for God's will in your life. God wants to live in us here and now on earth, even though he is holy. His eagerness is found in both the gift of his son and the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven represents the joining of heaven and earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Model surrender to God's will, as does Jesus' instruction. Forgive those who sin against us refers to the offenses similar to those we have committed against God and other people and for which we ask for forgiveness. We must pray this prayer from a believing heart that is sincere and submitted to God's will. True prayer involves responsibilities, honoring God's kingdom and doing God's will. The purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done here on earth. I'm reminded of the story of a woman who was so desperate for a husband that she knelt before the statue of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus and prayed, Blessed lady, please send me a man. I'm so desperate and I'm so lonely. An altar boy who was standing in the shadows heard the prayer and decided to have a little fun with her. So he imitated the voice of a baby Jesus and said, No, you can't have a man. The woman replied, You keep quiet, you young pup. I'm talking to your mother. Prayer affirms that we are not alone. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. True words. We must be secure in our relationship with God before we can bring any request before him. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of his highest willingness. Because he knows and loves us, we need never be afraid of the answers that he gives us. Jesus is at God's right hand, making intercessions for us. Only Christ can teach us, by his word and spirit, how to pray. God helps us to be a people of prayer. And we must ask the Holy Spirit, as all spiritual blessings are included in the Holy Spirit. Prayer is a powerful force that is available to us. It is an inner openness to God which allows his divine power to be released in us. The power of prayer is God's success in changing us. When you believe and do your best to get right with God, with your fellow believers and even with yourselves, death is nothing to be afraid of. God is a loving parent. He knows what will make us stronger and what will ultimately weaken us. He knows our potential and our breaking points. He knows what it will take to fill our souls for his kingdom. A good father will only give his children what is good for them, even though at times it doesn't feel like it. God is more inclined to give us what we need, just as a human father would do. Now, our prayers must be chiefly prayers of thanksgiving, 
but they must also contain an element of confession. We are not all God means for us to be. We need his mercy, his compassion, and his amazing grace. Sometimes we do pray for forgiveness, and sometimes we pray for the ability to forgive. We need God's guidance in this world, and we must pray daily for this guidance. The disciples discovered that through prayer, God gave them great power to help others, the same power that he gives us. When we pray, God often answers our prayers in ways we never ever realize. More importantly though, is that when we pray, God influences us to show the love of Christ to others, just as the Samaritan did for the beaten man in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' ministry demonstrated what a spirit-filled and a spirit-directed life looks like. Jesus promises his, the same spirit to his disciples, and the Acts of the Apostles shows that when the spirit descends on the community, they begin to live the spirit-filled life that Jesus lived. The poor were cared for, the dead were raised, the blind and lame were healed, the crippled walk, and three times when the disciples were in prison, God opened their prison doors and set them free. We live in a generation where there is little hope in our secular world. Today's gospel reading is about trust. It is about letting go of our resentments, our doubts and our fears. It is about believing that there is never a storm so violent that he cannot bring us safely through it. That there is no night so dark that his light cannot penetrate it. That nothing is going to happen to us that by his grace we cannot handle. To the unbeliever, prayer is an exercise in futility. But to the believer, prayer is the most powerful and the most reliable force in the world today. God has promised to hear our prayers. They will not go unanswered. Even though it sometimes seems that no one is listening, God is listening. He will answer our prayers in his own time and his, in his own way. He's not bound by human constraints. Our ways are not his ways. Our task is to trust that what we receive from God is for our best interest. Other people see the way we live our lives. And if we are sloppy and sinful, we can hardly hope to make others see the benefits of being a true Christian. Do we know how to pray as we should? Do we speak to ourselves or are we speaking to God? Do we merely ask for something or do we ask to be transformed? Can we say with conviction the words from a bumper sticker, Christ changed my life? The problem with our prayers is that we are not earnest enough. Jesus said there is only one kind of prayer, deep, earnest, heartfelt prayer. The Holy Spirit is God's supreme gift to us. It prompts us to continually pray to God. Jesus taught from the very beginning that a huge key to effective prayer is persistence and devotion to prayer over time. The disciples were continually devoting themselves to prayer, as mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, where it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And the apostles were very careful to practice what Jesus taught them. Persistent prayer is virtuous, not when it honors our own prejudices and frustrations, but when it yields and seeks the mind and heart and spirit of God. The Holy Spirit also directs our energies in the direction of our prayers. It keeps us sensitive to God's signs to change direction and ideas. It keeps us assured of God's love. God's gift comes to us because we are persistent. He gives to us out of his love, and he gives to us knowing what is in our best interest. We are to ask God to keep his name holy and our hearts and, and on our lips, to help us provide for our daily needs, to see the wisdom and necessity of forgiveness, and to help us lead a life that is pleasing to him by strengthening us against temptation. 
In his commentary on the Lord's Prayer, Martin Luther said that at times of distress, our only help or comfort is to take refuge in the Lord's Prayer and appeal to God from our hearts. If we attempt to help ourselves by our own thoughts and counsels, we will only make matters worse. This reminds me of a story about two guys who were walking through a game park and they came across a lion that unfortunately had not eaten for a couple of days. As it happens, the lion starts chasing the two men and they run as fast as they can. But sadly, the one chap starts getting tired and decides to say a prayer. Please turn this lion into a Christian God. He looks to see if his lion is still chasing and he sees the lion on its knees. Happy to see that his prayer has been answered, he turns round and heads back towards the lion. As he comes closer to it, he hears the prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the food I'm about to receive. A man was once offered drugs and urged to do his own thing. He replied, you don't understand. My thing is not doing your own thing, but rather God's thing. When Christians pray, may your kingdom come. They are praying, Lord, I want to do your thing. You see, a triumphant faith is more than occasional chill bumps in church. It is more than singing, how great thou art on a Sunday. It is doing the will of God on a daily basis. To abide in Christ requires faith and commitment. We must not sit passively by waiting for answers. We should be busy doing God's will while we are waiting. Yielding our will means accepting his prayers, to, his answers to our prayers. And prayer, as I said earlier, is the most powerful weapon. But this is a combat against our corrupt and secular world. We can't survive without prayer. The best way to honor God is to pay attention and be careful as to how we live our lives. We are to live our lives in community, hand in hand, heart in heart with one another. How we get along with each other today says a great deal about how we love and the kind of people we truly want to be. Amen.